am Sharish Nene, and on behalf of the DC South Asian Arts Council, I'd like to welcome you to the Literary Festival 2022. We had a fantastic start with uh, Gulzar Saab, legendary person. And now as we get into the festival, as most of you know, the DC South Asian Arts Council holds two major festivals. One is this literary festival and the other is the film festival. So to start off uh, today, we thought it appropriate to meet at the intersection of these two with lit the literature and film. And who better to help us explore this world than the very acclaimed Minakshi Shedde. Minakshi? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shirish. Thank you. So, Minakshi, you have uh, you've been the South Asia delegate for the Berlin F Film Festival since what, 1988? You've been Some prehistoric. It's <laughs> ah, amazing. You're very well established. You're very well known in those circles. Um, you, you've done workshops for Sundance. You've done workshops in the South Asian Film Festival. You've designed courses for the very famous Film and Television Institute in Pune, where, where I originally come from. So we oh, that's a really small world. For it, Sundance, it, actually, I was only a consultant. I didn't do a workshop, but I was a consultant, yes. Well, thank you. Today, what we're going to do is we'll start exploring these, the, the intersection of these two worlds, as I talked about. But first, I am so curious to know what drew you into this world? How did you get into the world of films, the film festivals, script mentoring? Tell us, how, you know, tell us what drew you there and what keeps you there. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely question. I haven't thought about it in a while. Um, actually, I think I was just like everybody in India is just crazy about the movies in general. Yeah. Uh, but there were people who, when I was around college and also in my early jobs, were really wonderful mentors to me. One is Amrit Gangar, who's a wonderful film historian, scholar, a writer, filmmaker. Uh, and he used to run a society called Screen Unit and just extremely generous in the efforts that he made to spread the film society movement. Uh, these, this, these were the days of 35 mm celluloid. So he would, you know, help organize these massive tin trunks with reels in them for every movie and, you know, go to the Russian consulate and Swedish consulate and Norwegian consulate and to get all these retrospectives, but also to hire the space to have these screenings. And um, then he would actually have um, what were they called? Like stenciled notes. They were these old-fashioned, um, not Xerox, but yeah, you had to, style notes. Yeah, you had yeah. those kind of. Uh, so you would type them out, cut them on the stencil, yeah. and then cyclo style them. So a lot of pains, and you know, or you know, like interviews with Ingmar Bergman or some fantastic review, because these were all, all, all. I, I know this sounds so funny, because all of this was pre-computer era, right? So we didn't have. OK, you can just zap it and just quickly Google and find out who wrote a brilliant piece on the seventh seal or wild strawberries of Ingmar Bergman. So so it was a very slow and uh, very painstakingly generous process. Uh, and then there was Maithili Rao, who was a wonderful critic whom I learned a lot from, and also Jilani Saab, F.G. Jilani, whose uh, pen name was Iqbal Masood, who wrote a lot in the media and Indian Express and so on. So two of these are kind of from uh, kind of an Ekalavya style that I learned a lot. But uh, yeah, that's how I kind of got into it. And what keeps me there? Uh, I don't know. It's a kind of junoon. What can I say? It's uh, I mean, cinema is an addiction. But I think I feel very, very, very humbled and very privileged to be part of a long process where somebody who is just a very gifted person uh, in film anywhere in South Asia. Uh, and I'm I have I'm lucky enough to have the chance to help a person who is very gifted and talented. Uh, to connect them to an international platform like Berlin. And I freelance for a lot of other platforms as well and festivals. And it's uh, I feel it's a real privilege because I think artists per se are not inherently uh, are very reluctant and not inherently PR marketing person and good at promoting themselves and pushing themselves out, etc. And I kind of make it my job to find out these gifted people who are uh, you know whom people don't know who are first-time filmmakers who don't know how to go about it etc 
um, and for their films to be selected at Berlin or top festivals worldwide or at uh, for festivals to trust my taste because all of these festivals get like Berlin gets more than 10,000 applications every year much more uh, and to pick maybe two three four five or ten or fifteen out of that uh, is going through hundreds and hundreds of rubbishy things to come up with these five or ten jewels and that's a, a privilege in itself so <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. You know, in our audience in, in this area, we've got a number of very inspired, talented, albeit amateur filmmakers. So I know you guys, you're going to be very interested in hearing what Minachi has to say. To start off with, let's take a look at this intersection between literature and films. And that's the script, right? So I know, and I, I did a little bit of, uh, you know, going through my notes. I know you've been a script mentor, consultant on film labs around the globe for 16 years. Sundance Institute, Screenwriters Lab, Australia, Asia, Pacific Screen Lab. And that's just mentioning a couple. Uh, earlier this year at the Dhaka uh, International Film Festival, you did five hours of intense script mentoring, pitch mentoring. Now, let's start off with a very basic question. What, in your mind, makes a really good script? Oh, that's a googly. It's a bit hard to kind of pin it down. Yeah. And uh, I remember uh, Pablo Picasso said something very lovely once, and I kind of paraphrase it. To know what you want to paint, you've got to start painting, right? So things happen in the process of doing it. There isn't a ready-made formula or a template that you can squeeze your stuff into. Uh, it's just something that should come organically from something you are burning to say, something you are very keen and something that bothers you a lot or something that you feel very passionately about, something that you want to share with the world. So it comes from within you yeah. and then one can, you know, polish it up or there are ways one can strengthen a script and so on. I would say at some level, it's kind of the same that I would say for uh, what makes a good film in a way. So it should be, it should surprise me. It should perhaps try and be unpredictable. Uh, it can probably try to uh, play on a range of emotions, not just one, like not just be happy or sad, you know, like tragedy, comedy, not, not fill, fill a checklist, right. but maybe appeal to different aspects, um, different emotions. I think you need to, you, you need to find a voice where you are, uh, inherently consistent. So there might be things, oh, you, you remember this great element from a Tarantino film, you, you remember a great scene from Bong Joon-ho and you somehow want to squeeze it in because you think that makes a masterly film or a masterly scene. And that's not actually a way to go about it. Uh, let it come from within. And if something flows, let it flow. But to try and squeeze things in, that makes it a bit tricky. And I would say try and Try and have a very strong emotional core. Find points that you will be able to connect emotionally with an audience, right? Uh, to have a script is one thing. To have a story is one thing. <clears throat> but to find points there, points in it organically that would emotionally connect with an audience, that would be fantastic. Just just points to keep in mind. Actually, it's, it's like swimming, right? As long as I'm just talking to you and we're ch ch chatting about it, uh, it's no fun. But... When we're down in the pool, you, oh my God, oh my God, you, yeah. you, you scramble a bit, and then slowly it will come. So it's, it's just the doing will, the doing will actually guide you automatically how to get better. So your advice to the audience: just go for it. it. Just do just it. Get it. into it and do it. speak from the heart, right? Like, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, as you're des uh, describing that, one of the things that came to mind, and this is something that we, we talk with our kids and with the wife the magic for, of, say, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter has got nothing to do with magic. It's got to be how you can relate to everything those characters are going through, the human element. And that's what I'm hearing you say. A good yes. script brings out the human element. You can relate to it. And don't wait, just do it. Absolutely. Fantastic. I, 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 I love that advice, as I'm sure our audience does, too. <laughs> now, let's take a, a slightly different thing. One of the things that we often run into, we find a book that we absolutely love, right? Mm -hmm. And then it gets made into a movie. And then you say, hmm, 
most of the time, what I hear is this, this didn't live up to my expectations. There's sometimes when the movie is actually better than the book, they're, they're two very different uh, media, right? So yeah. in adapting a book mm -hmm. to a movie, what, you know, what makes something work? Well, what makes it connect to the audience? And what do you have some examples of where it re really worked uh, that, that we can learn from? Uh, good question. And I, <clears throat> uh, it's again hard, unless we're talking specifics, to talk a little bit in the air. But I would say, I think uh, I think it's first of all extremely unreasonable. It's uh, it's hard to compare books to films because they're just two completely yes. different media, and it's like saying, "Oh my God, he's such a great cricketer, and now let's see if he can play tennis well or a volleyball match well." Boss, they're two different things, right? Yeah, exactly. So they're really it's really apples and oranges you're comparing, and it really doesn't make sense to me because they are completely different media, and one completely appeals to the imagination. Uh, when you're reading a book because you're imagining it and it's all in your head yeah. and somebody else is going to uh, figure out a completely different movie according to their imagination what's in their head so why will any two imaginations just match right that's not reasonable but I would say I would say when adapting I think the thing to keep in mind is to ask yourself why do I like this story what what do I want the most what is it that appeals to me about the story the most about this book or this novel the most i mean there is content again i would go back to what i said earlier uh there is something about that book that that really appeals to you or moves you or something strong that it's trying to say that connects with you the other thing again find emotional points like there can be a lot of lot of things that work in a book that don't work in a film because they're two completely different worlds uh so expect that some chunks are completely left out or something else is enhanced because it, you're transmuting it into a different medium altogether yeah. and uh to find key emotional points that will stay with an audience to try and make some scenes that emotionally resonate or are memorable to the audience but uh, maybe it's helpful if i get into a few examples or something more specific so that you're able to uh, understand what i'm saying so for example if you take Sanjay Leela Bansali's Gangubai Kathiawadi, which opened at the Berlin Film Festival this year. It was a privilege for us to open it then. Um, um, you know, it's, uh, I guess a lot of people in the audience may have seen the film. So it has Alia Bhatt, uh, who plays, uh, it's based on a biopic. Um, uh, sorry, the film is a biopic based on a real life person and uh, called Gangubai Kathiawadi. And who was a sex worker who organized uh, in uh, Kamatipura, which is Bombay's notorious red light district, who helped organize the sex workers and fought for their rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, full paisa soon. Absolutely. So this is uh, quite uh, a little bit different for me from uh, the 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 usual uh, films that have made uh, Sanjay Leela Bansali so popular. I think partly is um, that it's a bi that it's a biopic, right? So. A lot of his stories otherwise have come out of his imagination, uh, original screenplays. But this was based on a book, Mafia Queens, by S. Hussein Zaidi and Jane Borges. Um, and the original, if you read it, so actually it was a book on several Mafia Queens, of which Gangubai was just one. And the original one is just a small, it's a relatively small chapter in a book. So it's barely 30 pages. It's not actually a novel by itself that was adapted. It was just 30 pages. And when I interviewed him, he actually said, because I thought, if you if you just have a little bit then and you're fleshing it out into a two or two and a half hour movie then it allows you much more rain for your imagination for you to interpret characters and the situations the way you would like and he said absolutely yes that was an advantage that everything wasn't already spent out in detail and say see see book mein aisa tha aur aapne aise banaya film mein, right this uh, this apple and oranges comparison all the time so in a way it kind of liberated him to interpret it how he would like and there are several points of departure which i find really interesting for example you see the, uh, uh, for example, he introduces a romance, which is not there in the, not, in the, original, in the original chapter. Uh, and very interestingly, it's a Hindu Muslim romance, which is not insignificant. I find that really significant in today's India, which is extremely, extremely right wing, more and more right wing by the day. 
that when you're making a big Bollywood film, which has a lot of money invested, uh, you, you you will be very alert what signals and messages this film is sending out, right? So nothing is really accidental in a multi crore film, right? Uh, that you with big stars. You're sending out messages which may be conscious or unconscious or subliminal, but it's there on the big screen and magnified. So it's very interesting that it's a Hindu-Muslim romance. It's a different thing that it ends uh, <clears throat> not in a marriage. I mean, it's not uh, it's not very common that sex workers get married. It's not uh, a happy ending is quite rarely guaranteed, I would say. But also there are elements where uh, you, you saw the bit about the journalist who really fezzy by, who's really kind of lionizing or encouraging her kind of from the sidelines, making her more politically savvy in a way. And when he co when he covers this Azad Maidan speech, etc. So she's kind of even more empowered. And uh, when, the, you know, there's this campaign to kind of demolish this immoral uh, Kamatipura area itself. And they're all, all these sex workers, and there's like thousands of them who are going to not only lose their living, but also a ha a roof over their heads, right? So they won't have a place to stay and they've got kids, etc. in school. And she's trying to get them admission in school. So she's five. So it's a very, it's a very feminist film. It's a biopic. Uh, and I think because it's a biopic, it kind of reigns uh, the director in a little bit instead of his really, you know, the grand flourishes you'd find, say, in a Guzarish or a Padmavat or, you know, um, even a Ram Leela, which is very kind of incredibly energetic, raunchy kind of, um, you know, way of storytelling because it's a biopic and you're kind of break, broadly constrained by somebody else's story that's already there. Uh, he's kind of reined in, but he still manages all his uh, wonderful Bansali flourishes that we love him for, including a fantastic Kavali at the end. <clears throat> so there's a kind of, <clears throat> sorry, you see this kind of relationship with the journalist, which is even kind of like he has a crush on her type. Uh, yes. um, and expresses a little delicate frisson there, which I like very much. Um, then she actually goes to meet Jawaharlal Nehru, the first <laughs> Prime Minister of, of Independent India, which there is a mention in the book, uh -huh. but it kind of fleshes it out and it kind of forces it at a time where they're going, they're, that whole area is to be demolished to cleanse the, the, the city. And she goes to ask him for their rights and she obviously succeeds uh, because uh, Kamati Pura continues till today. So there's a lot of that kind of feminism and strong, uh, you know, um, like Hindu Muslim elements. There's also the big the big reason she becomes a mafia queen, <clears throat> sorry, is because of, a again, a crime collaboration between a Hindu and a Muslim. So she ties up with, she has a kind of alliance of sorts, a practical alliance with Kareem Lala. Uh, who's uh, who has a different name in the film because you can't really talk about the actual mafia guys and he offers to protect her uh, which is why she becomes this big grand political person she wins elections etc cetera, etc cetera. so a lot of these things are fleshed out a lot more and dramatized and uh, a wonderful 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 screenplay by uh, I think it's probably her first screenplay Utkarshni Vashisht who worked with Bansali earlier uh, in his earlier films but I think it's her first proper script as a screenplay uh, with which Sanjay Bansali wrote with her and with dialogues with her and uh, Prakash Kapadia, who is also a uh, Bansali veteran. So that's very interesting. But also, for example, let's talk about a film that uh, people may be more familiar with in the US, The Namesake by Mira Nair, this exquisite film that is an adaptation of an already exquisite book by Jhumpa Nairi, uh, and um, in which we have Tabu and Irfan completely incandescent roles. Uh, playing uh, uh, a first time, a first generation family that moves to America, uh, settles there and has a child, uh, a son who played by Cal Penn, who has a, an identity crisis. So I'd say that uh, in the book, we mainly have, it's kind of leading up to Gogol, who is the son, uh, his identity crisis, him trying to kind of turn his back on the Indian part or his name and his identity and to fit into the American culture and society. Uh, and um, Sorry, is there a disturbance or can you hear me clearly is that, you? are you hearing a disturbance no or we can go no, no okay. we're, we're. but um but in the book we actually find quite often that it's ashima's point of view the mother played by taboo it's uh, a lot of the film is seen through her eyes although she's a kind of a secondary character i mean there's both ashok and ashima and their son gogol uh, whom we uh, pay attention to in the book but in the film, it's much more her viewpoint that we um, see, her perspective that we see much more often. 
and also there are sometimes these lines which are not in the original like this line we just heard where he says you know where there's a horrible train accident that kind of defines his life and why he names his son gogol and um and he says um what is uh, something about uh do i remind you of that accident of that terrible day and he said no i remember everything after, after that, and yeah. every day since then has been a gift now this is a wonderful line written by the screenwriter sunita raporwala who's absolutely a completely brilliant 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 screenwriter who's had a very long <clears throat> career long collaboration with mira nair and of course she's written for several others but they've had a particularly long and wonderful collaborations going back since uh, mira nair's first film salam bombay and then you know so many others mississippi masala and so on down to name say and um and i think i like how this uh, thing shift but also it's so much about the detail about the texture about how you visualizing things right so um a scene about ashima for example fitting a uh, trying on ashok's shoes for example to know what it looks like to literally be in someone's shoes uh, adapting to a new life in a strange country cold country far away and you know this lovely details that irfan brought you know like he's going away at the airport and kind of nods his head to say bye because he's too shy but i so i think that the film is a lot of detailing and texturing about a uh, kind of unexpressed love when you know somebody loves you but they they don't say i love you which usually happens in indian marriages and indian relationships and you know from all these little details how much love there is which doesn't need to be expressed verbally right so there's a lot of this non verbal thing which i find really lovely mm -hmm. and um also i would say um and then in a nice way gogol actually who who changes his name from gogol which might otherwise be such a conceit right an indian family naming their son after a russian novel right so he changes his name to nikhil and then later uh he understands why gogol means something in their family and also kind of reconciles with his dad so it's kind of coming back a full circle in a very beautiful way and um i think another example that like i'd like to give you is i think um what did we say we said name say gangubai i think um white tiger by ah, ramin yeah. bayani yep, yeah yep. which i think was really really interesting because it's the adaptation of arvind adiga's book of book of prize winning novel yep. and ramin bayani of course is an american director of iranian origin and they were buddies in college and oh. uh, it was this very high profile film that happened with uh, uh Eva Duvernay's uh you know uh, being executive producer with these very high profile stars Priyanka Chopra and uh Rajkumar Rao and this really absolutely dynamo packet Adarsh Gaura yeah. and um I wanted to say that you know while the original novel Arvind Adhika's White Tiger uh is a very very unforgiving mirror to Indian society it's very brutal and it's about a low caste guy who comes from the village and is employed as a driver and as you see he takes the rap for his boss uh, for his employer running over somebody on the street in the car but um i have to say the uh, the film and the novel offer a much more satisfying ending you remember the salman khan case of you know yeah, uh, running exactly. over so poor guys lying in the street yeah. and satisfyingly the novel and the film offer a far more version of justice than was available in real life to the victims uh, uh, of the people who died and the driver but um Uh, so it's 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 fantastic in its craftsmanship the film but i think what bothered me was that it was a kind of western slum dogified view of india with you know shitting in public cows monkeys gods uh, and i think what compounded that was a kind of worse an nri view which of course berani is not uh, an nri gaze on india in a way because for example you have the driver teaching priyanka and rajkumar rao how to pray hindu style like this i mean come on this was like uh, a bit much yeah. but i think in the adaptation because there was so much going on in the novel uh -huh. and they were trying to condense a lot of that into the film i think the device that was used is a voice over which is not always a uh, highly recommended but i mean it's it's a commonly used device but there's like a constant voice over so balram halwai is talking to himself as a voice over you know you want to hear his thoughts all the time you want to you have a voice over with him talking to unnamed persons who are not visible in the screen you have voice over with him talking to somebody it's like multiple voice overs a kind of wall to wall voice overs which kind of takes away a little bit um from the film uh, as just as a as an adaptation device right you're adapting one world yeah, into another it can be more of a crutch than as opposed to doing real visual storytelling 
exactly exactly you totally you totally put your finger on it so what i would say is show don't tell right yeah. we're always being told uh, and good filmmaking ideally would and and he's a very accomplished filmmaker i mean he had 99 homes earlier which was at the venice festival etc so he's a very accomplished director uh but this i think was one of the um uh, challenges i think but otherwise it was a very very well made film that really uh, very uh, addressed in a very brutal way uh, or rather addressed with clarity brutal issues to do with caste class corruption in india goose the goose culture this bribe taking yeah. culture in india and how one can exploit somebody who's poor and has no compunctions about it so it was very well made and of course there's a whole lot of very good adaptations which a lot of people are familiar with including for example Vishal Bhardwaj's three fantastic adaptations of Shakespeare with the uh, Omkara of Othello, Makbul with uh, Macbeth, and one more Haider of Hamlet, just brilliant and quite original. So a lot of original storytelling that came in. It didn't just lift Shakespeare and park him in India and uh, you know a cookie cutter mode. Very original. So those are also landmarks for me. Yeah. Well, actually, you gave us some gems out here, both for the audience as well as filmmakers. in adapting a book to a movie first it's remember the obvious there are two entirely different media if you try to copy one into the other you know you're going to fail the other thing is what's exciting about that adaptation is we want to see the filmmaker's perspective and it might be something completely different from the book i love what you said about when you read the book this movie kind of plays in your head yeah i mean, i i we've always read to our kids so you know reading the hobbit or the lord of the rings i've got a certain view and i look at the movie and say hey that's not what gollum looks like that's but whichever way enjoy leave aside that enjoy the movie and for filmmakers don't tie yourself in to doing that express yourself the audience loves to see something new they want to be excited by your vision so that was fantastic advice and i imagine this is the kind of thing when you talk to your you know as your mentoring when you uh, help people in the scripts so maybe at dhaka i imagine these are the kinds of things that you guide them through very much so i think another thing that came through and there's a fantastic book called script scripting bollywood a fantastic yeah. book by anubha yadav that came out uh, some time ago and she actually interviews 14 women script writers in bollywood very 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 accomplished uh, writers including shama zaidi sai paranspe so many good writers juhi chaturvedi and then she also does a kind of historical aspect of women writers uh, who go back to the silent era in the 1920s and 30s and um uh, there's something there that i really liked for example so um like uh, when i work with people i really like them to narrate the story to me i i can read it i do read it but i'm much more interested in hearing the script i've yep. always done it instinctively because i never learned scripting i'm never i don't have a, a piece of paper saying i have a degree in it or certificate it's just in instinctive that has come from long experience of 15 years or more just working with scripts and filmmakers and uh, i always like to hear it always say do me a narration right uh, also india is such an <clears throat> sorry oral storytelling culture because when you hear it you hear what that person's version of the script is yep. when i'm reading i can't hear his voice <clears throat> and it was lovely for me to see uh in this interview with urmi juwekar who did a six month binga lab institute screenwriting program in amsterdam yep. and this was one of the things she understood that go beyond the script to hearing because uh because they explained to her that when you that cinema is about images and about emotion so in audio is the nearest a writer can come to expressing your feelings in audio you can hear somebody's feelings right when you narrate it but on a, a bland paper you can't actually connect with those feelings in the same way so that was a very interesting uh insight for me which i done instinctively without knowing that it's an official way of uh doing a great job but uh that that's also interesting also because you know hollywood has a completely by contrast uh they need a bound script all the time uh you know signed off by everybody circulated to everybody i'm not saying that isn't the way to do it and i think that's very helpful as well but i think individual filmmakers want to do different departures that they like some people like uh, juhi chaturvedi says in the book she says 
यू नो वेन एन एक्टर साइज ओ मैं ये लाइन इस तरह से बोल सकती हूँ क्या बोल सकता हूँ क्या यू नो कैन आई से दिस लाइन डिफरेंटली एंड शी सेज you know i've taken 3 years to write this sentence exactly as it is right so it's a writer who's chiseling 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 words uh, fine tuning all the time to make it perfect and then you kind of you know do an essay essay with and do whatever you like with it interpret in your own way so these can be sometimes two different things so there's no there's no standard way of going about it sometimes um directors in india or elsewhere don't like a script at all they have a broad idea what they want to do but they rather bring sometimes they prefer non actors they like to put them in situations and let them respond in their own way they have a broad idea how the story will go but yeah. they like them to come up with their own own script in a way their own dialogues to be spontaneous so there are many multiple ways of storytelling there isn't one way of adapting or anything so there's always an individual chemistry for an a director and his actor and the screenwriter to actually pull that off in an organic way i love it So you know, we started off talking about the intersection of the literary world and the film world. We've been walking along this path on the literary world. So let's go a little further along this bridge now to films and film festivals which mm-hmm. you are intimately familiar with. And if if I look at this in putting film uh film uh, festivals together now the organ uh, the organizers of the DC South Asian Film Festival what kind of advice would you give them in terms of what do you think are the responsibilities of a festival curator beyond just selecting scheduling films and relate to that thought uh, what elements beyond film screenings develop and cement that relationship between the festival and its attendees. Oh that's an excellent question Shirish. Thank you for asking that. So you're right. So uh, selecting films is one thing, screening is a different aspect. But I think the real glue is a social glue. It's it's the joy of bringing people like-minded people together and putting them in a room or in a space where they can interact and have connections with each other and to cinema. So one of the great things that I learned from Berlin and yeah this will be my 25th year working with berlin as wow. yeah <laughs> so i think one of the great lessons i learned is that some of the the greatest things that you can do in a festival are free so if a film is say 90 minutes and you have a 2 hour slot for the cinema you know to clear out the popcorn etc cetera, etc cetera, to prep for the next show so you just need even a 15 or 20 minute a q and a after the screening and that is an extremely vital part of the 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 social glue glue process and i realized how vital it is because that's when i learned when you know it, there's also an incredible skill in moderating it's not always only to ask yourself ask the the right questions but also give a chance for the audience to interact and also to know when not to let the audience run away with the mic because you want the the discussion to be interesting for everybody yep um so to ask a couple of key questions which actually are insightful where the answer is likely to say something interesting for the audience to know but also to give the audience a direct oh a, a direct a connection to a celebrity a director or a star or whoever it is oh i asked alia this question and she answered me or bansal or whoever it is right guarantee right. you know whoever it is bong joon ho so you you have oh my god you know this person talked to me right so it's also to build that personal connection but also i think it's all the hanging around in so for example at uh, a screen unit where i said i used to watch films but i first learned about cinema through amrit gangar i think the best part of the movies was the adda baji after we were all you know wander off to some irani uh, you know have exactly, right? badmasa chai and the adda baji after actually i think was the real glue that taught me about cinema because you're just absorbing images in a screen and you don't always know how to interpret them you don't always know how to what to make of it you know what you make of it but you don't know what the rest of the world of people who are really into it um you know how how uh, everyone sees a film very differently in his own way right so i think that adda baji i think making spaces for that adda baji is a very powerful uh, thing and the other thing that actually has come out of this pandemic more uh, in the last 2 3 years actually so i think is also to do with um uh, you know um 
I don't know. Is that something that you you wanted to touch on as well? Yeah, I don't know. Please, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. I think the great thing is because a lot of festivals were not held in the first one or two years. Is to do with how it suddenly a lot of visionary people were able to turn competition into cooperation. So, for example, one of the big ones was uh, We Are One. There was a global film festival with I think maybe about twenty one um, film festivals collaborating to have key films online. Yeah. At the Berlin Festival, for example, one of the its contributions was not only a film, but a long Q and A, and I think it was with Ang Lee. Uh, you know, a long, a long like an hour long question answer. And I think this is what uh, was the rich thing of the many tragedies, horrific tragedies that uh, Corona and COVID have brought upon humanity. I think some of the uh, the kind of fallouts, unintended fallouts, was. It, gave, it forced us to stop and think and recalibrate our lives and recalibrate where we are going and reconsider where we are going. And I think one of the things was also in film festivals, to take your question further, was to look at, um, you know, I'd really, we can't just, uh, we can just have a festival for 10 days or whatever it is, but we'd be, uh, we'd be actually nurturing this relationship with the audience much more if we had occasional year-round or regular year-round activities. So you're building a year-long relationship with your audience and with the arts, right? Yeah. So um, Shirish and I were together on some uh, on a fantastic uh, collaboration, I think one or two years ago during Corona, called COSA, yes. which is a collaboration between key uh, several key South Asian festivals, including the one in Seattle, uh, the Chicago one, there was a Nepali one, there was a Vancouver, and I think there was Miss, yeah. Miss App in uh, Mississauga. So there were like these five or six festivals that collaborated online. And I really, really, really hope that once Corona hopefully leaves us soon and we go back to whatever normalcy is, uh, that those collaborations continue. Like when you bring a guest speaker or a star or a talent, that you can maybe share costs and have this person travel to three or four festivals or maybe have some sessions online where others can also plug in right so things like that or find other ways to collaborate because that is so much more you know to have synergy uh, between festivals makes so much more sense and also collaboration between the arts which dc saki is already doing uh you know already like synergy between film and literature and maybe many more later with the arts with music etc so you're again also building synergy uh, between the arts with the same population or expanding your audience. So I think these are some of the points I'd like to share. Yeah. You know, that that re resonates with a lot of things I've been hearing. There was one time when I was hearing, oh, we miss the physical getting together, which, yes, all of us do. But lately, as we see, you know, hopefully from our lips to his ears, that Corona is fading away, I hear a lot of people say, but you know, one of the things I really like, I can be in DC and I could watch something in Chicago. I could be somewhere in Vancouver. I hope that element continues. So with all the different film festivals, like you said, let's keep this portion as a going away present from the pandemic, that we keep the virtual element and the collaboration and just extend that reach. I think that's that's a really beautiful thought and i've heard that from so many different people um let's see uh, as i look through all of this there i'm going to uh, go on further to you've been on the jury as well of different film festivals and i remember you know as reading about your background there was a festival, if I remember right, it was in Korea, it was to do with the horror genre. Something yeah. that was not your style at all. <laughs> and I've done a little minuscule part for the last seven, eight years I've been on the jury with the BC South Asian Festival, but I see all kinds of films and there's some things that just not my shtick at all. But then, yeah, you focus on and try to do it. How do you deal with uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, when you're in something like, let, let's take the Korean example. Gore is I not can't bear it. Right? Oh, God, it was a nightmare. I can't bear it. But I was also, I felt very obliged because it was, uh, I was very, very honored to be on the jury. It was of the uh, Bifan, Bucheon International Fantastic Film Festival. That's when I, 
I kind of had known about this, but not everybody knows. There's a whole sub-genre of festivals called fantastic film festivals, okay. uh, which don't only mean great, uh, fantastic in the great sense, but uh, especially dealing with fantasy, horror, what is known as midnight man madness, zombie films, you know, that kind of uh, gory, horror, thriller, that yeah. kind of stuff. And I think uh, the reason I was particularly honored, I mean, I have an old relationship with them. I think like, I don't know, like 20, 25 years ago, I had curated a Bollywood package for them ages and ages ago. And uh, this was their 20th or 25th anniversary, actually. So to be on a special jury like that, I was very honored. And I said, oh my God, it's horror films. I couldn't bear it. Like one of the first films we saw had, ee, it was like a zombie film. And there's this very ordinary but very elegant kind of dinner party in a country house, like this very elegant country house. And there is some kind of difficulty and somebody hires a new, uh, how do you mean, like a, like a help to serve the guests, etc. And later we realize that she's a zombie. We don't know. She just looks like anybody else. And then she goes inside and finds the, the master, like the sons of the master of the house. He's lying in bed, not very well. And then she examines his leg and it's got like there's a close up of that leg and it's got it's not only bleeding, but it's got a million maggots wriggling Ooh. in the leg and she lifts up the leg and she bites it. And I'm saying, oh, like this is whatever is the opposite of Sone Pe Suhaga. Oh, my God. It's like horror upon horror. I was like, so normally I cannot bear horror films I uh, uh, and films that are scary. I just kind of hide under the carpet if I can. So I'm always kind of, uh, you know, uh, turning my eyes away from the screen because I can't bear to watch them. And I'm always asking my neighbor, tell me when it's over. Tell me when it's over. Uh, I'm really not a horror person at all. And I'm fairly easily scared. But this really took the cake. And there were several hours of it because we were watching. And you just got to kind of steal yourself and say, OK, now let me see what else worse they can do than someone eating maggots on a bloody leg, right? And there were... <laughs> There were plenty more, even more horrific, because this was only the starters. But um, I think one of the things that I've been very grateful to understand as a critic early on is to actually be able to distinguish several arts, right? So filmmaking takes many, many, many talents together. And I've always told film critics, because I've also been a mentor on film critics labs, etc., uh, one of one of the important ways of looking at a film uh, for a review is, of course, to respond to it as a as a critic in whatever way you normally would. But in addition to that, if you could try and pay attention to the individual departments in it, right? So, uh, cinematic. Uh, what is the direction like? What is the screenwriting right? What are the actors like? What is the cinematography like? What is the editing like? What is the music like? What is the sound design like? And when you divide. When you pay attention to all these, you think, oh, my God. And then it might occur to you that in the most wretched, wretched, wretched film, actually, the cinematography was brilliant. Or the editing was extremely, extremely good, which is why it kept your it kept your attention throughout, even though it was so wretched and it's not your scene at all. Yet, it you know, you were watching it till the last. And there is some talent in the editing, for example, right? Or in the screenplay that editing is not only cutting a film at the end, editing is also part of screenwriting, for example. So once I was on a national jury in India many years ago, and we had a filmmaker on the jury say he was very, very lovely. And he said his name is Chitrat. And he said, bakwas picture banane mein kitni mehnat lagti hai, to achhi picture banane mein kitni mehnat lagegi. And I never forgot that line. It's basically saying that it takes so much talent and hard work and craftsmanship even to make a really bad film. Imagine how much effort and craftsmanship it takes to make a great film, right? I yeah. never forgot that because nobody sets out wanting to make a bakwas film, a rubbish film. Everybody wants to make a great film, right? Some films don't turn out the way they were meant to or don't turn out great. But that doesn't take away from the hard work. I'm not saying bad films automatically are good. I'm saying if you're able to make these distinctions of the different elements that take uh, that make a great film, um, you're often able to see good things even in trash. Is what I'm is what I was trying to point out. That, you know, that, <laughs> that's a great point. And whenever I am on the jury, what I tried, whatever the film is, just knowing how much effort has gone behind it to compartmentalize and give enough feedback in those elements, not just you're rating the idea, right? you, you, I give this rating. 
I think that is important. And to take that idea of go away from horror, move further. There's sometimes you see films that have an ideology that might be completely antithetical to yours. But that is the beauty of this you know, of film festivals. Sure. As opposed to living in echo chambers, you get this diversity. And that's important, even with that whether you're an audience, a jury member, whomever, it gives us a chance to recognize these are also human beings. It's so Absolutely. to demonize people, whether they have political, religious, whatever thoughts, diametrically opposite from yours, there is always a human element, and this helps you bring everything together. Absolutely. I'm also tempted to add, and this isn't a recommendation or so, but I'm all often tempted. And I think one of the reasons I'm generally, by and large, far more empathetic as a critic, never, ever, ever saying that a bad film is good, but in general, an inherent empathy and respect for filmmaking as artists per se is because I myself am a filmmaker. And when you understand very differently, you understand an art form very differently when you're a practitioner. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not primarily a filmmaker, but I had directed a film many years ago, a small short film called Looking for Amitabh. Uh, it went to some 12 festivals and stuff. And actually it was, you know, it was a commission it, as part of an anthology film for some uh, festival in Bombay called the Kalagora Festival. Dave Benegal had yep. commissioned us to, had commissioned five people who are not filmmakers to make a five minute film on Amitabh Bachchan. <clears throat> so the subject was given and the duration was given and you had to be creative within that. So there was Jaideep Merotra, the painter. He had asked Anand Mahindra, who's an industrialist, but who, who was turned out to be busy then and asked, uh, someone else to do it instead. Uh, I was a critic at the Times of India, a journalist and a critic at Times of India. I'd never made films before. So I made the film only by interviewing blind people on what are their mental impressions of Amitabh. Wow. So these are people who have not only not seen Amitabh, they're blind, they've not seen anything. Most of them are blind from birth, they've not seen anything. So it was evoking Amitabh through all the senses. It kind of turned out to be a love letter to him, a valentine to him evoking him through all the senses except vision through smell through hearing through touch through instinct etc right so when you actually make a film you suddenly have a tremendous respect for what you're seeing on the big screen because you understand the effort it has taken to do a film right so i'm often tempted to ask critics to try and make a tiny five minute film sometime in their lifetime to understand what it takes it's never going to make you say it should not make you say that a bad film is good but just to understand what it takes to make a film at all. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Minachi, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Our audience, guys, I hope you've you know, enjoyed this thing as much as I have talking to Minachi. She's given us some gems of you know, insights into all these different areas, literary, filmmaking. Um, the rest of the festival is very exciting. It's one of the things that I love about the uh, this particular festival, the DC South Asian Literary Festival, is how eclectic it is. You'll see different points of view. You've got, you know, starting off with the legendary Gulzar. Someone is acclaimed as Minakshi. You'll meet first-time authors. Uh, I'll be moderating three more uh, discussions throughout all this, and I look forward to you joining me out there. Minakshi, we hope to see you out here and afterwards. You know, we don't have a Irani place out here, but come over. We'll, we'll have muska pao and I'll make chai. <laughs> you can have a bun muska chai on my behalf. There you go. But thank you very, very much also, Shirish. And I'd like to thank uh, Manoj Singh and DC Sal for inviting me and for having such a great festival. I'm very honored also to come right in uh, on the festival right after Gulzar Saab. But uh, thank you for a lovely session. I really enjoyed it myself. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. Namaste. Bye. Bye. <laughs>